All right, let's go to our preaching time. I want you to open your Bibles to two places, if you will. Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And after that, we will go to Matthew chapter 21. But let's begin with Psalm 8, verses 1 through 4. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, and uh, excuse me, the work of thy fingers, uh, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Now go forward to Matthew chapter 21, Matthew 21, and verses 15, 16, and 17. Matthew 21, verses 15, 16, 17. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, Thou hast perfected praise. And he left them and went out uh, of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. When I was a kid, back in the 1960s, maybe the early 70s also, I have to confess, my sister and brother and I watched a lot of television. And everything that preachers would warn against, so much garbage and filth coming on the television in those days, they were right. And as years went by, I saw it begin to appear. We stopped watching. And uh, But those of you who get all of your information from the Internet, let me say the Internet is the same thing, only you have quicker access to whatever you want, and it's uh, the same filth multiplied by uh, 100 million. And I'm not kidding about that. I'm probably underestimating it. But there was a TV show um, which was like a live children's television show. And the host's name was Art Linkletter. I think it was called Kids Say the Darndest Things. And uh, they would have little children, you know, on the show, like contestants. They'd go to each one, ask them questions, and uh, see what kind of responses they'd get. And he asked a little girl about five or six years old, Honey, have you ever been in love before? And she said, No, but I've been in like. Which was Pretty good for a five-year-old girl. And uh, all parents know that, that children utter some things beyond their own years. They say things, um, <laughs> and sometimes the way they phrase it, it makes you want to laugh. You don't want to laugh in your kid's face. But um, every mom, especially moms, they record these things their children say when they're four five, six years old, and long in there. Um, but uh, when my, and I can't preach this outline without invoking my own children to some degree, but when my son was small, we were looking through a picture book of the planets in the solar system, and I pointed to one, and I said, that one's called Pluto. 
And he looked at another one and said, is that one called Goofy? Of course, Disney's got their name brand in the minds of everyone, no matter uh, how old or young they are. But um, I was watching a TV show called The Doctors uh, four or five, six years ago. I think it's still on. And uh, they had a young family, young couple, with a little boy who was about three. And uh, they did an ultrasound because she's expecting another. And on the uh, live television show, they discover she's expecting a little girl. And uh, they all come out onto the stage, live TV, and they ask the little boy, or they said to the, their son, Mommy's expecting a little girl in her tummy. And uh, your little sister, what would you like to call her? The boy scowls and says, brother. But um, like I say, I watched a lot of television when I was growing up. And uh, in Sunday school, I was taught to recite the Lord's Prayer, or the uh, 23rd Psalm, excuse me. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He making me to lie down in green acres. Because that was another TV show. Uh, <laughs> A very corny, a corny oddball TV show, but that's how I said it. And uh, today I want to uh, preach a sermon that I call Out of the Mouths of Babes. Out of the Mouths of Babes, if you want to write an outline down. This won't be terribly lengthy. But point number one, little children can receive Jesus Christ. I'm glad they can because that included me once upon a time. Um, our text says the chief priests and the scribes heard a bunch of young people praising Christ in the temple. And the Bible says they, the scribes, were sore displeased in verse 15 of Matthew 21. And the reason they were displeased is because they were jealous. They were jealous of the Lord Jesus Christ. They couldn't get people to follow them the way they followed Christ day after day after day. Multitudes, thousands of people hanging on every word Christ would say. And they were jealous. The Bible later says Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered Christ to have him crucified. No one would follow them across the street the way they followed Christ, uh, wander in the wilderness, and no one even thinking enough to take food for themselves. But they couldn't get people to follow them. And uh, the Bible says, for jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Uh, Proverbs 6, verse 34. Every unsaved cultist, every uh, unsaved Democrat, I mean, every, every unsaved politician knows that the secret to perpetuating their movement into the future is to gain control of children, young minds. The earlier they can do it, fine. Ken Hovind points this out. And uh, I, I never thought about it before. But he said, you pick up a picture book of uh, dinosaurs for aimed at three and four-year-old children. And uh, the first words in the books are a long time ago or millions of years ago. They teach the children to doubt what they might read in the Bible about the timetable and when God made uh, Adam and the animals and the creation. They teach children to doubt what they would read in the Bible before they're even old enough to read. To show them pictures and say millions of years ago. And um, But when the Lord was asked by the disciples, who would be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Uh, Christ set a little child in the midst of him. And he said, Whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child, receiveth me. Matthew 18, verses 4 and 5. He said, If you don't have a humble childlike faith, the way these do, you're not going to make it. You're not going to get in. 
Little, little kids. By the way, even the word kid originated in the 20th century. They didn't used to call their children kids. They could be 18, 17 years old, uh, and they'd still be referred to as children in the household. That's just a more modernized term, kids. Uh, kid used to be referred to, uh, would be reserved for uh, baby goats, animals like that. But he said, if you don't receive me with the simple childlike faith that these exhibit, you're not going to make it to heaven. You're not going to make it. Um, we had a girl who lived uh, two doors from us when I was growing up, my sister's best friend. And uh, she believed what her mother told her. Kids are trusting. They, 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 they don't have natural doubt and skepticism uh, over every issue. She believed what her mom told her and didn't, couldn't imagine her mom misleading her. But she was uh, 13, maybe 14, before she realized and learned that storks don't deliver babies to expectant couples. Yeah, you'd see it in cartoons all the time, Disney cartoons and all. And so she and her mother told her that's where babies come from. She was 13, 14 years old before she realized that's not true. But children are very trusting. They want to believe their mom and dad. They want to trust their parents. But um, children are very trusting and very innocent. And um, some would even say gullible. But that wouldn't, who would ever take advantage of that um, innocence uh, has punishment waiting for them someday. Paul commended Timothy when he said, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. For 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. I was saved when I was six years old, under my father's preaching. He preached about the fact that God has a right to judge sinners. And uh, normally I'd be sitting there right about where Timothy sits, um, just goofing off, fool fooling around. But this day I was paying attention. And um, I realized if that's true and all have sinned, then I'm a sinner. I didn't know much about sin. I knew I disobeyed my mom and dad many times. But um, if God has a right to judge sin and sinners, he has a right to judge me. And I knew I didn't want to go to hell when I died. And so my dad gave an invitation and I walked a short distance right down here and was saved right in front of this, well, not this pulpit, but I was saved right here at this place, November 5th, 1967. That was nearly 53 years ago. And how I'm only 32 years old now, it's a, you know, as the new math they were introducing back in the 60s. But um, some people, people may still doubt how much a child understands at that age. How much do they really understand? Well, I tell you what, I have met people who are saved. They can give me a testimony of salvation. They've been saved 20 years. They've never read their Bible yet. I have to wonder how much they understand. But kids understand more than we give them credit for. Little children can receive Jesus Christ. Point number two, little children can praise Jesus Christ. They can praise Jesus Christ. Do you know some of the best music we've ever had in our congregation? <laughs> I've been helping Pastor Kim, been here uh, almost 18 years. And some of the best music that we've ever had comes from, came from, um, uh, what's their names? The Right the Patch music? Yeah. Um, and uh, when it's not only orchestrated well, but sung, by kids who've been taught to love it and to sing it with joy. That's some of the best, most beautiful music I think we have. 
and um, to hear children singing it, uh, it, it really can't be duplicated with all grown-ups singing it. It was written uh, for children to sing. And when their voices are lifted in praise to the Lord Jesus, it's a wonderful blessing. When I see our young ones here uh, singing out loud, I love him because he first loved me, purchased my salvation on Calvary's tree. Um, that beautiful name from sin has power to free us. That beautiful name, that wonderful name, that matchless name is Jesus. And I see some of the younger ones forming those words on their lips, learning to sing for Christ uh, without hesitation. It's a real thrill. It's a real blessing. It's a real joy to see it from this direction. And thank God for it. But um, when uh, one of our daughters was young, uh, she would sing, Hold the Fort. Oh, my comrades, see the signal. Waving in the sky. Reinforcements. Now appearing. Victory is nice. Yeah, victory is nice. Victory, victory is a lot more nice than defeat. But uh, whenever I see or hear our young people singing praise or quoting scripture, uh, it is a real blessing to witness. Our kids, three or four days at summer camp, come back that following Sunday and they've memorized an entire chapter and they're able to stand in unison and recite it for us. And um, you, you, what could be more profitable, teaching them the scripture or teaching them some stupid theory of evolution and natural selection and uh, taking them out to the woods uh, to, to get away from the city and spend a few days in nature and then come back and have no appreciation of the God who made it. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise, Jesus said. They say in the world, any friend of so-and-so's is a friend of mine. Well, God is interested in his son, and he's interested in anyone who is interested in his son. The Apostle John says, he that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It's that simple. 1 John 5, verse 12. Uh, when the Pharisees got upset at the multitudes, especially the children, praising Christ, he told them that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Luke 19, verse 40. Thank the Lord for children who know they're saved, and they don't mind saying so publicly. Little, little children can praise Jesus Christ. Thirdly, let me say, little children can learn about Jesus Christ. Learning to trust God from an early age, daily, is one of the best character traits you'll ever adopt. Uh, and the best one uh, your children can ever adopt. I've often wondered about children who are not exposed and given the benefit of the gospel and the Bible stories that, are, that, that should be reinforced to be true. Every character in the Bible is based on a real person. The Bible doesn't waste your time with all kinds of fictional characters. The, the real action um, is based on real people in the Word of God. Um, Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Mark um, 10, verse 14. Our kids in Sunday school know a lot more than you'd realize. And you realize, D.L. Moody returned from a, a sermon one time and said we had two and a half people saved at the meeting. 
someone thought, well, two grown-ups and a, and a child? And he said, no, two children and a grown-up. The grown-up's life is half over. The children, presumably, have whole lives yet to live for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's a good way to look at it. When Solomon wrote, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, well, it, it naturally assumes that young people are able to remember thy Creator. They're able to appreciate and praise God for what He is, who He is, what He's done, what He can do. Uh, when our when our son, he's not here, so it's okay for me to talk about him. He was about five or six. We bought him a little, um, like a Fisher Price plastic tape recorder. And um, I was walking down the hall and walked right past his bedroom door and heard him in there recording himself reading the Bible onto a tape. And I think he missed one or two of the bigger words, but that's okay. All grown-ups do, too. And um, he was right at the part where Christ was rebuking and reproving the scribes. Uh, he said the, um, the um, re re reproving and rebuking the um, Republicans and sinners. <laughs> But that's actually pretty discerning. <laughs> Republicans and sinners. And uh, I'm not even a friend of all Republicans or sinners. And I fall into both of those categories. Um, my brother-in-law, who is a very liberal Berkeley graduate, unsaved, but he paid me a very high compliment years ago. He said, Mike, you're probably the, the most conservative guy I know. I took that as a as high praise indeed. But I told him, you don't get around much. I can introduce you to some guys that are far more conservative than me. <laughs> they scare me. But um, years ago, <clears throat> my two nephews, Jim and Jared, they're, they were visiting here. Jim was about uh, nine, maybe he was nine, eight or nine. Jared, seven years old, perhaps, and um, Jim's in his, you know, mid-30s now, uh, making a career in the Air Force. But we were having Sunday school class, and Randy Chapman was uh, teaching the class in those days. And he asked, he said, we, we just got done singing Amazing Grace. And he asked the kids, can any of you tell me what grace means. What does grace mean? And he raised his hand and said, God's riches at Christ's expense? That's an acronym, G-R-A-C-E. And someone could say, well, that's obviously some answer he learned in Sunday school, and who knows if that was original or not. Yeah, it was probably something he was taught in Sunday school. Um, but it was the right answer. How is it that a lot of people, they can get 35, 40 years old, 45 years old, and have no idea where they're going when they die? They have no appreciation for the death of Jesus Christ and what it means to the entire world. So he was uh, maybe eight years old, and he knew the right answer, God's riches at Christ's expense. And uh, yet so many people profess to know Jesus Christ, and they couldn't tell you how to be saved or what the grace of God meant uh, if their eternity depended on it. And it probably will one day. Um, when, my, when my son was... Um, four years old. He told my wife and I at church one night, I want Jesus. Dr. Buckman was preaching, and he was sitting on the pew between us, and uh, suddenly he said he wanted Jesus. 
Well, you don't get uh, invitations like that very often. So we went home and um, went in his little room. I wanted to see if he still had the subject on his mind. And so I went in his bedroom and he did. Of course, I had to remind him of what he asked and make sure he and I were talking about the same thing. And you don't know how much um, a four-year-old understands. How much do they grasp? But he was exposed to the preaching and the Bible uh, singing week after week after week and reinforced in Sunday school class. And um, so I tried to explain Christ suffering on behalf of sinners as a, as a sacrifice that he didn't have to make. I said, what if your younger sister was, was punished for something you did? And she never told the truth. She never complained. She took the punishment and um, you didn't get punished. She was punished for you doing something bad. Wouldn't that be a good thing? And he got to thinking for that, about that a moment. And he said, so you mean Christ died instead of the sinner? That's exactly what I meant. He understood more than I would have given him credit for. Kids understand more than we think. Little children can learn about Jesus Christ. And uh, lastly, little children come in all ages. <laughs> I'll see if I can explain that one. Little children come in all ages. Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus said, Ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages. That's how they would begin their show. Sometimes babes and sucklings are not just little children. Jesus prayed Luke 10, verse uh, 21. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. They were grown-ups, he was describing. He was describing the crowd of adults and grown-ups listening to him. Sometimes grown men and women say things that are completely innocent. You recall how um, Christ said to Philip, uh, uh, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. He wasn't trying to hide anything or uh, impress someone or make an impression on someone that wasn't quite true. Christ said, there's an honest Israelite right there. But I was working in um, Pensacola at a funeral home, which is what I do here, too. And uh, we were preparing for a service in our chapel, crowds of cars pulling in. And I was standing outside by the entrance, and a guy comes in, squealing his tires and slamming the car door, and angry. And the guy standing next to me said, "Man, that that guy is as mean as a junkyard dog." He said, um, "I guess it takes all kinds to make the world go round." I'm glad I'm not one of them. That's what he said. I'm glad I'm not one. What do you mean? Everybody is one of them. Everyone's one of them. You can't exclude yourself. But the way he said it was completely innocent. He didn't realize how silly it would sound. We were passing out tracks one night, it's been years ago, up at the market up here um, at uh, uh, Fourth and Grove. And Mexican lady came out of the store we were outside passing tracks out, and um, I offered her a track, and she said, oh, no, no, I'm not a, a Christian. I'm a Catholic.
You couldn't have been uh, purer in the way you said that. That was the purest answer. You see, no matter what the rhetoric of the Catholic Church is, that we're Catholic Christians and uh, separated brethren and they're true Christian. No, no, no. The Catholic people know the difference. Especially some innocent Mexican lady whose English may be very limited, but she's here in America and she knows there's a difference between being Catholic and saying I'm a Christian. For them, Christian doesn't convey the sense of authority that the word Catholic does for them. That's too bad. But um, water baptism can never wash away your sins. It can never wash away the sin in your heart. Church membership can never guarantee that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And finally, let me tell you about a man I worked with when we were living in Florida. Yeah, his name was Paul Evans. He was a funeral director, and uh, he and I worked together. And there was, there was a third um, guy we worked with. He was um, a part-time Southern Baptist preacher. Well, he, I tried to witness to Paul, but I never could get any clear indication whether he was saved or he knew what it was to uh, trust God by, by Christ alone. And uh, we were sitting in the break room. We didn't have much business. Um, Ontario, California has two funeral homes. Pensacola was about the same size and population. They had 17 funeral homes. I mean, it's kind of like uh, down in the south, you'll find church's chicken for every church. Uh, it's just almost that way with funeral homes. Anyway, so we were sitting um, just drinking a lot of iced tea all day long. And um, the other fellow, uh, Lynn, he and I were talking about the different ways people uh, think you have to get to heaven or things you have to do. Do you have to join a church or do you have to be baptized in water? Do you have to do this or that? And uh, can you lose your salvation, etc., etc.? And uh, the whole time I was wondering what Paul was thinking, listening to us talk. And uh, finally, Paul speaks up, a southerner, so my accent might not be very good, but he'd say, uh, well, I don't think anyone could get saved except through the blood of Christ, could they? I said, that's it, Paul. That's exactly it. And uh, I thought, you know, he was just as innocent in his remark and in his faith in Christ at that moment as anyone ever could have been. I think he was 58 years old at the time. And within a year, I drove out to the little town he lived and was a pallbearer at his funeral. So I had no doubt he understood that only the shed blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to wash away his sin by faith. And I expect to see him one day. Sometimes little children come in all ages. David wrote in Psalm 8, verse 2, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the, the enemy and the avenger. Children that know Jesus Christ and are happy to praise him, happy to say so, and are taught to love Jesus Christ and love God and praise him without hesitation, those children are going to stand as a rebuke to someone much older who thought salvation depended upon his uh, allegiance and faithfulness to a church or to a denomination and find out that wasn't it at all. Funny how the um, Lazarus and the rich man, Luke 16, um, most people would have thought the rich man had all kinds of wealth and um, blessings in life, and Lazarus was poor, the dogs were licking his sores, and uh, was, he was willing to 
eat scraps if the man would give it to him. And um, they both died. And in the story, afterwards, the tables were turned. Lazarus was now comforted by Abraham and in the blessing of God, where the rich man found himself in hell, in torments, being tormented by the flames. So what seems to be obvious uh, in this life may not be the case in the life to come. The tables had turned. And uh, those children, young children, who know they're saved, they've been brought to Christ by loving parents, loving Sunday school teacher, some, the, the influence of some pastor, uh, they're going to stand as a rebuke and a reproof to people who thought church involvement, church membership, uh, church activities were the solution. That was the way. And the tables will be turned. Let me say, and I'm going to close right here. As I have said a thousand times to all of you, I got saved when I was six years old. And uh, my son, I was able to lead to the Lord when he was five years, when he was four years old. I talked recently with one of our church men, Brother Calvin led his son to the Lord at five years old, just recently. And uh, I hope you and your wife have made sure you wrote the date down, the time, and whatever you can recall of that conversation. Uh, and don't let yourselves forget it. Don't let him forget it. Remind him of that. Um, it'll be a blessing to you in years to come. And um, we have other young ones. We have some young ones back there, uh, two young ones over here, some younger ones over here. And uh, when I... When we see them turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to be a great day of rejoicing in our church. And we want to pray to that end. But uh, someone, some church whose children come through Sunday school at, after, you know, first, second, third, even fourth grade, and they're not saved yet, is a church that's not doing its job. That's, a, that's a, maybe even parents who aren't paying attention. They're not doing their job. Maybe the pastor doesn't know what to do. But it should be a simple proposition to lead young kids to a saving knowledge and a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It really should be. And uh, why it's overcomplicated by so many is a great mystery.